Welcome to the Information Management 360 podcast, brought to you by Archive 360, the industry experts in information management for the digital age. The Information Management 360 podcast delivers thoughtful conversations about compliance, records management, data security, e-discovery, and much more, so you can learn how to better manage and protect your data in the cloud. So let's get started. Welcome to the Information Management 360 podcast. This week's episode is titled The Impact of Privacy Regulations on Business. My name is Bill Tolson, and I'm the Vice President of Compliance and eDiscovery at Archive360. Joining me today is Jim Bannock. Jim is a compliance architect in the M365 Center of Excellence, supporting Microsoft partner enablement and readiness around the Microsoft 365 compliance portfolio. Jim has been focused on the Microsoft portfolio for the entirety of his 16-year career as both a Microsoft partner, directly enabling customers' Microsoft Cloud solutions, and now as part of Microsoft's working directly with teams building the capabilities that enable those solutions for customers. Jim helps customers and partners transform their businesses using Microsoft 365 Cloud following the guidance and framework that allow them the ability to use the platform in a secure and compliant way. Greetings, Jim, and I really appreciate you taking the time today to speak with us about data privacy and security. Really looking forward to the discussion. Sure thing, Bill. Pleasure's all mine, and thank you for having me on here. Great. Okay, well, let me kind of open it up here. I'll give a little opening of what we're going to be talking about today, and then we'll get into the discussion. So with the continuing rise in both internal and external cyber theft and ransomware, and with corporate misuse of personally identifiable information, federal and state governments have begun to enact privacy and security laws to force companies to better manage and protect the PII, personally identifiable information, of individual citizens. The EU's GDPR and California's CCPA and CPRA were the first of a new breed of privacy laws that focused on giving individuals greater control of their personal data, its accuracy, and how it's used and sold, as well as requiring minimum levels of data security. But as more states and individual countries create their own differing privacy laws, the overriding question from companies has quickly become, what will be the impact on those businesses trying to comply with the numerous current, new, and changing data privacy laws and environment? In reality, companies will be forced to implement new processes and procedures audit employees' adherence to the new policies, purchase new technologies to make sure they're handling and managing data at the most appropriate level, and constantly train their employees on the changing policies and technologies. The driving factor for this new privacy and security environment is that all industries are experiencing a dramatic increase in cyber attacks, ransomware attacks, and the ever-evolving variants of extortionware, which specifically target employee and client personally identifiable information. In fact, the average cost of a ransomware breach in 2021 was $4.62 million per breach, with 44% of ransomware tech attacks specifically targeting client and employee PII. Additionally, with privacy regulations fines reaching $20,000 per incident, and that's from the Colorado Privacy Act, the total cost of an organization to an organization can reach tens or hundreds of millions of dollars per attack. And with the move to hybrid and remote work, overall corporate data security have kind of inadvertently been reduced because of how quick companies had to react to that new thing of everybody moving home for a period of time. As I mentioned, foreign governments, the U.S. government, and individual states have begun to introduce and in some cases pass into law data privacy and security bills. Now. Probably most of the listeners have heard about, again, the GDPR, the CCPA, but you know we have a new California Privacy Act. We have a Virginia Privacy Act. Many other states have been putting bills forward, including Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York, Minnesota, Utah, Washington State was one of the first. They actually haven't gotten a bill through yet, but they were kind of the poster child for these things. And then countries like Brazil, China, and Canada, and so forth. In fact, our federal government, the U.S. federal government, has several privacy bills introduced in 2021, two of them that were very close to kind of what we're talking about here today, one by Senator Gillibrand of New York and one from Senator Jerry Moran from Kansas are both good to look at. With that, so 
Jim, on all of that, and I know there was a lot there, do you have any thoughts on how these new privacy and security regulations will affect or are affecting businesses, end users, ID departments, IT departments, and so forth? Have you gotten any feedback from your Microsoft clients on what these new regulations are doing to them or for them? That's a great question. And it's a conversation we're having a lot with our customers, our partners. But I think the overwhelming theme is, as we hear about these new regulations, privacy is no longer just IT's responsibility. You can't just go in and turn a few knobs and dials and say, I'm compliant. I'm passing all the regulations. It really becomes a enterprise-wide effort. We need to educate our employees, whether they're in the back office, on the front lines, what it means to respect the privacy, but also respect the data that's being processed by their customers. It's touching all aspects. You could have a organization that needed PCI compliance. They have it. Marketing agencies have privacy requirements. And then obviously, when we start talking about regulated industries such as financial and healthcare, they're some of the strictest regulations. And they're the ones that are being updated most frequently. But when we look at that, as I said, having users at the center of this is so important, that user education. But we often find that they're overwhelmed by the guidance they receive from organizations on what to do with personally identifiable information. And they don't understand why they're getting notified and saying, hey, you were trying to share this piece of information, or maybe you shouldn't be storing it there. Users are given guidance on how to classify documents, what can be stored where, who they can share it with. And they're all coming from different departments. You have IT just wanting to prevent data from leaking out. You have compliance groups. You have privacy offices saying, let's not keep this information. This certain information is a record. It's going to be supported for this long of time. And sometimes those are conflicting. And then all this time, as you mentioned, the move to remote work, this great resignation we're living in right now, IT teams are understaffed compared to the amount of alerts that need to be acted on. So all that's kind of created this sometimes perfect storm of moments that when we're dealing with more and more data than ever before, the chance for having an incident is that much higher and why we need to kind of use the tools and technology and be hyper vigilant from education on up. That's a great point. And, you know, I run across sort of the same thing on the litigation side, e-discovery. Employees can inadvertently make mistakes with data. A lot of times they're not doing it on purpose, but if they make a mistake and end up exposing customers' PII or responding to a phishing attack or whatever, those kinds of things, that still can put a company in deep water. It doesn't matter what your intent behind it was. It was, did you leak data or not? Was a breach successful or not? That's one of the things, and I think, Jim, we've mentioned this in some talks. Companies over the last 20, 30, 40 years, basically the focus on records have been, I need to capture those 5% of the enterprise's records for regulatory compliance and all the other stuff. Hey, you know, employees take care of that. The vast majority of it is on their laptops or workstations. We don't care about that stuff. We got to worry about those 5% of company documents that are responsive to regulatory retention requirements. Nowadays, I think we're getting to the point where if a company doesn't know what it has, it can't be compliant anymore. It's not just those records, but it's all of the data because that data can include PII that if leaks out could put you into trouble and all kinds of stuff. So the question that I think we can eventually get to is how does a company manage all of the data within their enterprise not just those 5% of records, meaning all of that data sitting on laptops and workstations and file servers and so forth. Because now with the new regulations, those are all being affected by security and privacy requirements. I think you're right there, Bill. And the cloud has just made this infinitely more pervasive because you're not an IT administrator staring at a rack of storage anymore. And a user never thought of that. But Gone are the days of quotas on mailboxes, quotas on my home drive. And we've trained people and the consumer market actually brought this upon us a lot is many of us have become digital pack rats. Search has become so easy that it says, well, let me just keep it. I may need it. I don't have to worry about where it is. And 
you know, I think we've all been on that. If you see those pictures and images of people with thousands and thousands and thousands of unread emails, go back five, 10 years ago. I mean, a thousand unread emails. The next thing you know, they're getting that note that says, hey, your mailbox is full. You need to delete some information. So the prevalence of being able to easily store information and then what you said, where it can be stored can be anywhere. You have the, you still have your traditional on premises data locations, maybe your ERP platform or your other key line of business may have not shifted to the cloud, but you're in the process of moving that there. So whether you're in one of the public hyperscale clouds out there or third party solutions, and then there's the third party solutions that you as an organization have management and control over. And inevitably, you're going to have that shadow IT environment out there as well, where people may be storing things because it's more convenient, because maybe your organization's policies haven't kept up with allowing people to use the cloud or breaking down those barriers of that easy collaboration. And I think that's why it's so important that as an industry, we've really seen people going toward and adopting that zero trust methodology. That's really at the baseline of all of this. Identity, we're talking, you know, that's always that control plane of where everything is pivoted around. And it's what a user is doing. And are they doing it from secure places with a known location, with known devices? And then we're going to allow them access. So that's kind of that first step of we know where they're coming from. And then we can say, all right, now at least I know where the data is. Then as you said, what do I do with it? How long do I need to keep it? And depending on the regulations in the industry, some say you may need to keep this forever. Others are like, we only need to keep the relevant information. And that's changed so much because it's so much easier to store things now. Yeah. One thing that occurs to me every time I talk about this subject of, do you know where all your data is within the enterprise? Not just what IT has access to, but where all the data is. Because if you get a data subject access request saying, what kind of information do you have on me? You have to be able to report in full. And then if they come back and say, I want you to delete it, if you don't know where all their information is and you end up not deleting some of their stuff because it was sitting in unknown repositories or on laptops that the IT department doesn't have the ability to index or look at, then you're in violation. The one thing you learn in e-discovering lawsuits is you always have to assume that the other guy has that smoking gun email. So don't say it doesn't exist because they will have it. (laughs) That's always a mistake. So in this new environment of privacy and data subject rights, you have to know where everything is to be able to be compliant with the law. And then as you were saying, do you know where everything is? And then what do you have? I used to work for a great CEO years ago. He would say, gee, it costs anywhere from 200 to 500 times more to find the information that you're looking for when you need it than to store it for 20 years. So storing it is one thing, but also being able to find it when you need it is something else. And that plays into the whole privacy thing, right to be forgotten and that kind of stuff. I think that that searching for it, that's really what the cloud has allowed us to do so much better. It's what the machine learning capabilities have allowed us to do so much better. But now that people are used to being able to easily search for it, there's an expectation that you can very quickly come upon this. And I think that's what a lot of these privacy regulations have shown is, like you said, it doesn't matter if you missed it or not. I mean, there's differing levels of fines, depending whether an inadvertent or a kind of purposeful leak of private information. But either way, governments are saying, hey, people are entrusting you with their personal information. You need to do everything in your power to know where it is. You don't just get an E for effort anymore. (laughs) Yeah. You know, if the company suffers a breach and that information is exposed, the data subjects, the end users now have rights to go after you in one way or another. And they should. Because like you say, they're entrusting you with personal information that if used incorrectly or illegally can cost the end user large amounts of money and lost hours and all kinds of stuff. So taking the days of taking data security, especially around PII, kind of lackadaisically are on because it could put a small to medium-sized company out of business overnight. What is it that GDPR fines can reach 20 million euros, right? Exactly. And I think as I was reading up on some of the other regulations as we were preparing for this, you look at something like Brazil's new privacy regulation. A lot of these 
groups, they'll kind of tear or differentiate and say, hey, the really large corporations that have the means to do this, we hold to a higher standard. But Brazil said, I don't really care about your company side. You can be a five person organization or a 5,000. You are just as much responsible. And I think it's only a matter of time before we see more states or more countries kind of take that hard edge where, as you said, if a privacy issue happens to a small business, it could put them under almost instantly. And I think it's on all of us as part of the broader industry to say, how can we help enable these groups to do it effectively, knowing that they don't have the budgets of Fortune 500 companies to do so? Absolutely right on point. And the other thing that most people don't think about is what do these new requirements do to a company's cyber liability insurance rates? If you're not making the best attempt to secure data, I've been told by insurance brokers, your rates are going to be way higher. (laughs) And if you suffer a breach, they're going to be even higher after that. So taking it seriously affects the bottom line because besides the bad press and hit the shareholder equity and all these other kinds of things and fines, that can follow a privacy issue, it really is becoming all-inclusive. In fact, we talked about many of the states, you mentioned the foreign countries, you know, China has a pretty strict new privacy law. India is working on one that is very, very inclusive of all kinds of stuff. But I noticed, Jim, just on December 10th, the Federal Trade Commission filed an advance notice of proposed rulemaking with the Office of Management and Budget to basically start creating and putting into the federal register privacy laws at the federal level because the Congress has not gotten to the point where they've even gotten to the point of actually issuing anything or passing a law. So the FTC is now saying, well, gee, we're going to start writing laws into the federal register without Congress. You know, the FTC law, basically, the filing says the FTC's intent as seeking to curb lax security practices limit primary abuses, and ensure that algorithmic decision-making does not result in unlawful discrimination. But it'll be interesting to see how the FTC, what kind of rules the FTC comes up with, and if they're not shot down in court somewhere. But at least they're trying to do something, which, you know, I'm disappointed in the federal government not being on top of this, to tell you the truth. Yeah. And, and I think sometimes this helps to think of that of a group like the FTC will say, hey, To do business with the federal government, you need to abide by these standards. So many companies here in the U.S. do business with the federal government in some way or another that it ups the game. You used to see this and you still see it in military contracts all the time. And what drove the creation of so many of the government and sovereign clouds that are out there is sometimes it may not be the law of the land. But just to do business with other companies, you have to apply to this. And I'm hoping, you know, maybe that's what drives it is some of these bigger firms and organizations and entities start setting standards that say, look, to work with us, you need to apply to this. Here at Microsoft, you know, we have our privacy and standards of compliance and says, if you want to be a partner of Microsoft, you must agree to do A, B, and C. And if you don't, sorry, but, you know, so many groups do business with Microsoft that it kind of forces the hand of a lot of corporations. That's like the HIPAA regulations for business associates, not even the data controllers, but with the business associates, they're just as liable and they have to sign up for this stuff to be considered in the in crowd. And with HIPAA, I mean, you could be looking at gigantic fines as well. It's one of those things I've been following the state privacy regulations all around the country. Last week or the week before, I did a podcast with Minnesota State Representative Steve Elkins. Very nice podcast. He was one of the co-authors of the Minnesota Privacy Act, which did not pass this year. So he's going to do it again next year with changes and stuff. But one of the things I asked him, and I've looked at all of the state bills, and they all read, except for the California one, but all the rest of them read very similarly to each other. And they're relatively kind of nebulous when it comes to things. One of the things I asked them is, in the Minnesota law that didn't pass, I said, you had written in there that a controller, a data controller, shall establish, implement, and maintain reasonable administrative, technical, and physical data security practices. And I said, well, what is that? And most lawyers that I know, they've all said, well, any first-year lawyer can be successful arguing against that. What's reasonable mean? So I asked the representative, I said, why 
the fluffy, wishy-washy language. And he said, in reality, all of the states, and probably half the states are working on these things right now, they all pick data or content from other states' practices. So many states have gone to the Washington State Privacy Act and taken language out of that. And they say, well, this is good enough, put it in here. There's not a lot of thought put behind it technically. Most of the state representatives or state senators are not IT folks. Now, Representative Elkins actually did have 25 years in in the IT industry before he became a representative. But he said, yeah, that's a mistake. And the states among themselves have talked about becoming more prescriptive. And I said, you know, what I would like to see is maybe a requirement that all PII is encrypted while at rest and while in transit. That's not next generation technology. It's been around forever. So why not stipulate in your bills that PII must be encrypted? And he said, you know, actually, that's a great idea. And he said, we've actually talked about that. We'll probably include that in the next bill. So if he gets in his bill and it passes, then other states will copy it and so forth. But I was wondering, Jim, what you thought about that. Have you had a chance to read any of the bills and any thoughts on any of them? It's funny that you brought up like that, because I think it's a struggle of if I'm a business and saying, all right, what do I need to comply with? Like you said, what is reasonable for one group that's spending millions of dollars in my privacy office alone? Another one is, you know, some other group may say, hey, I put a warning up on my website. How do we give that right guidance in there? And I think having the nebulous language in the laws, it can be a double-edged sword. It lets the evolution of technology dictate the pace of what we're reasonably able to do. If you think conversely, going into something like the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the DCMA, it placed such strict requirements on what could and could not be done that you just saw it challenged in court time and time again. This is technology had advanced what the law was written for. So I think some of these laws are trying to kind of be a little bit of technology agnostic or future proof in there. So they're not saying thou must follow these three steps in the NIST regulation to be compliant, but saying, hey, do what you feel is reasonable. You know, it's kind of the same thing to the legal language, the commercially reasonable efforts. If customers are going to keep demanding, that is the bottom line is we as consumers are being smarter and smarter about what is tracking our personal data and what we're able to control it. You know, I think we've got operating systems and platforms that say, every time I open a new app, I opt into it tracking my information or not. So we're hyper aware of that. So it's almost like we're letting the consumers push the industries and groups such as Microsoft and others are kind of stepping up and saying, all right, how do we fill the gap with technology so that businesses can do this at scale with these immense amounts of data and signals that are being collected out there and do it in a way that we feel is comprehensive and meets the needs of these organizations. So like what we said in the beginning, if that lawsuit does happen, that they can say we tried our best and that there isn't that phantom email or mysterious email that wasn't showing up in first discovery that's that smoking gun. So I think it's on the onus of everyone from the people that are making the technology to the people that are processing the data to us as consumers holding everybody to as high of a standard as we reasonably can. Yeah, that's a great point. And like you said, most of us do business in a free market. And if you are sloppy with customer data, then eventually they will stop doing business with you and go elsewhere. So it's to your own self-interest to potentially spend the extra dollars and the extra time to become more secure because people nowadays, especially again, with all the ransomware and extortionware and stuff like that, are becoming much more aware that their data can be a problem for them if misused. So of course, I'm in the business, but I know people who aren't that that's something in their thought process. Gee, has this company had an issue in the past and why would I do business with them? Why would I give them my business? Of course, that's a longer term thing the free market reacting. It is, but I think at the same point, the information dissemination is so much more important. You know, let's think back a few years ago when Petya and not Petya happened as ransomware. It didn't make the national news. Go this summer, you have things such as the Colonial Pipeline. Everybody knew. Everybody knows what ransomware is now. And, you know, they know that the first thing out of the mouth is 
not that you know these organization systems are locked. It is extortionware. They're taking the personal data and threatening to sell it on the dark web or other places. And I think when I talk to customers about our compliance solutions, the first thing I tell them is, how much is your customer's trust worth to you? How much is protecting your IP that differentiates you from your competitors important to you? That's a lot of when we're talking to people about not only privacy, but also insider risk and information governance of you're running on trust. Microsoft has a slogan, Microsoft runs on trust, because if our customers lose faith in us and our ability to properly protect their data, that's a big problem for us. So we want to be as transparent and trustworthy with what we're doing with the data at every possible moment and move. Yeah. Well, Jim, you had mentioned several minutes ago, zero trust. Can you talk about the new privacy security technologies companies are looking at to address the new environment of data privacy and security? At its essence, zero trust is how in the industry we think about access now and getting access to our data and continual attestation of what's going on. So no longer is it enough for organizations to say, I've got the best firewalls in the world. Everything inside my corporate perimeter is secure. Even before this new way of working that we were living in, that was starting to break down. The cloud started breaking it down. We're accessing information from our laptops wherever. So we need to pivot how we were looking at things. And in Microsoft, what we think about this is talking about the identity first and what's happening on it. And then making sure I'm accessing it with a secure device, whether that's my mobile device or my computer, and that I can attest that it is compliant to my organization standards. And you couple that with things such as multi-factor authentication. If I put a plug in here, if you're not using multi-factor authentication, whether on your personal information, your corporate information, wherever you can, go start doing it. There are a number of applications out there. Microsoft has our Authenticator application that lets you not only manage sign-ins for your corporate information, but you can do this for anything else that you access. I know I got an email from Social Security this weekend. It said, hey, to access this, you need multi-factor authentication to get at it. So even my vacation clubs that I look at have multi-factor authentication. So everybody knows that Identity breaches and harvesting passwords are still the number one way many attackers can easily get into organizations. It's not through sophisticated code executions or flaws. If we look at the current vulnerabilities that are out there with the log4j that's there, you know, that's a very real issue. And it's one that's going to keep a lot of security professionals very busy, but those are determined people. A lot of, I would say, would be hackers or other information, they're going to say, look, path of least resistance. If I can send a well-crafted email and get someone to click on a link that then captures their password, great, I'm going to do it. There's a whole industry that is out there where you can buy phishing kits on the black market. And that's really scary. It's ransomware for hire. So how do we prevent that? Multi-factor authentication is the first big step of that. Then it is having those modern devices. You know, where can I reduce on-premises infrastructure? How much can I use the cloud and the scale of the cloud? I mean, Microsoft handles trillions of authentications on a regular basis. Nobody's getting more authentications out there that say Microsoft and a few of the other type of scale cloud providers. So we've seen it. And then how do I bring that all together? How do I say, hey, this looks risky. Bill, you signed in from Colorado at lunchtime, and then two hours later, you're signing in from Germany. You probably didn't travel there unless you broke the speed of light. So we can identify those. Even the best funded security departments in the world probably don't have the telemetry and scale to capture that information. So that's the first thing I would hear with a lot of customers and thankfully has come around is they say, hey, I can do security better than Microsoft. I can do it better than Amazon better than Google because Microsoft had that one thing that made the news. But when you look at it in aggregate and what they're doing, I think the power of the cloud and the power of these signals and the machine learning that can be put behind it 
it sets the table stakes that much higher so that now you as a security group, you're spending more time hunting for a specific threat than just looking at the logs to say what is happening. And that goes from everything from that sign in all the way to what sensitive information is in my environment. Where do I have HIPAA related information? Where do I have things that have to comply with SOCs? Where are the credit card numbers stored? The cloud provides the ability to search for that at a scale and level that didn't exist before, or just only the largest of the largest companies were able to handle. Yeah. With the move to the cloud, then you have the ability to dynamically upscale storage, upscale your CPU usage for short periods of time if need be. I mentioned PII should be encrypted. You have systems now that will recognize PII and say, well, gee, I need to encrypt that. I could do field level encryption. I could do anonymization or a pseudo anonymization. And that all happens potentially in the background and you're using encryption technology for that. And then you get into encryption key management. A lot of the issues companies have is a SaaS provider is encrypting data up in their third party cloud and the encryption keys are kept up there as well. So the cyber crooks can go up in there and potentially find it and use the encryption keys. Sometimes the encryption keys are used on multiple customers, those kinds of things. So Microsoft has, for cloud encryption key management, they have Key Vault, which is a very secure area within the cloud that protects those keys. And then you even go the next step and say, well, gee, I want those encryption keys stored on-prem. I don't want them kept in the cloud. The big FinServes, the big banks, Wall Street banks, that's one of their requirements is encryption keys cannot be stored in the cloud, period, in some cases. So that extra ability to maybe encrypt the data on-prem and move it up to the cloud and keep those encryption keys on-prem is yet another security potential that customers are now, CISOs are starting to ask for. Right. And I think that all comes back to organizations' digital maturity and their level of trust. And I think that's where the cloud is such a great democratizer there. So if you are a small business, you would know nothing about key storage, and field-level encryption. But you do know I'm storing stuff with customer information. Out of the box, let's have some rules that detect the most common things that are out there. I need to comply with HIPAA. All right, what are the sensitive information types that are out there? I, as a small business, I'm probably keeping the majority of my data in something like Office 365 or a SaaS solution that may partner with it. I'm not building line of business apps in Azure or in AWS or Google where I can take it to the next level. But the great part about it is even Microsoft, our SaaS solutions, a lot of times are being built on those core building block fundamentals of Azure. So you mentioned Azure Key Vault. What we're doing, what we brought together when we had bring your own key, host your own key, those same solutions are enabled by Azure Key Vault. So you can get that level of capability in a SaaS cloud, same way as you can in a pure cloud that you're building your line of business pass application in. So I think it's that level of sophistication. We meet customers and you know it's important on meeting customers where they are in that digital journey and providing them. The other thing you mentioned, having that data encrypted and where it's stored. And it's really interesting when you look at some of these new encryption messages, maybe homomorphic encryption that's out there is saying, all right, how do I make sure that the data is there and it's encrypted? Only I can decrypt it, but I have the services that can reason over it. And I think that's really important because I think the thing that can prevent people from using the power of the cloud sometimes is just that, is that I'm the only one that wants to control my keys, control my information. But the minute you do that, Now you say, all right, well, now I can't take advantage of the machine learning in the cloud to identify all the sensitive information because I've encrypted it before it's got to the cloud. So how do you balance that? And I think there's some really interesting stuff coming along in the industry that hopefully can unlock that and make it a little bit more democratized, while at the same time, making sure organizations have 100% say in what's happening with their data. Yeah, no, you mentioned homomorphic encryption, and that's really been of interest to me. We adopted for our security gateway, that is an on-prem solution that works with the cloud and our cloud information management and archiving application. Utilizing homomorphic encryption basically enables you to keep the data encrypted while in transit and while at rest, but also while in use. So the data 
never has to be decrypted. I won't get into the technical details of homomorphic encryption, but it is that next step. And the cloud enables it because you do have that extra CPU available if you need it. And that's one of the things that I've asked the various state representatives and senators is, when can we move to that? This technology does exist. You don't have to specify a specific vendor. It exists across the industry. So why not? So, you know, encryption, again, it's one of those technologies that is really available that every business should be using now. There's no reason to put PII in danger of being stolen or breached if the technology exists. And that's what I want the state representatives to look at, too. But that encryption in combination with role-based access controls, the system is smart enough to know, well, Bill signed in. He's in a zero trust architected system now. I want to get into uh, SharePoint and look at some stuff, or I want to get into Salesforce and look at some stuff. And the system, based on roles within, for example, Microsoft Active Directory, knows which type of information I should have access to and will limit me. I could sign in and maybe I see some emails, but the social security numbers have been encrypted and they don't make any sense to me. If I was somebody else with a higher authorization, I could sign in that same email and the system would know to decrypt that stuff for me automatically. That's becoming a basic security procedure that companies should be using now too. And all of the, no, I shouldn't say all the crowd systems, the ones that I know about, including with Microsoft and you know Microsoft with Active Directory, it's all built in now. You just got to set it up. Those are like the base level security requirements that everybody should be using. I would be surprised if insurance brokers are not close to making them do it. Yeah, and I think that may be what pushes it. It it may not be, I would say, the governmental regulations that drive this, but it may be, like you said earlier, insurance costs for cyber are just going up and up. And we may find that it's the insurance companies that say, hey, you don't want to have a exorbitantly expensive policy do these things. You think about even in the auto you have seatbelts, you have airbags, your insurance policy goes down. Are we on the verge of seeing similar things in corporate insurance policies for cyber risk? Yeah. Like you say, it's going to be cost that drives it. The cost of not doing it is going to be more than the cost of applying the new security processes, procedures, technologies, and so forth. We've talked about the privacy regulations in general, but I think regulatory requirements in general and the cloud Obviously, we both talked about many companies are moving in cloud, and they all will be there eventually just based on cost and available technology. And you've mentioned machine learning and AI. One of the advantage of a big platform like, for example, Microsoft Azure, they have all of these various technologies available for vendors to use. For example, you mentioned machine learning. You know, We take advantage of Microsoft machine learning capability within our products to be able to utilize that and go to that next level of, for example, predictive categorization and things like that, predictive supervision on the FinServe size. And I know I just kind of stated it up front, but Jim, are there any other advantages in using a cloud platform to complying with regulatory requirements, privacy requirements? I think one of the other ones, and I'm going to touch on one of our products, actually, uh, Compliance Manager, is there are hundreds of regulations. I think one study I read said there is a change in a regulation somewhere in the world every 20 minutes. And when we talk about large companies, we talk about in these privacy rules, it's not there's one set of rules that apply to you when I'm located in a certain country or state or region, but also where my customers are. My customers are global. So it's almost inevitable that one of these privacy regulations touches you. How are you staying up to date on that? hundreds of regulations with thousands of updates. And if one changed, how do I know if I fell out of compliance or not? So even tracking regulations, you know, take away the really cool technology like the AI and machine learning and real-time sensitive information type scanning, but just tracking regulations, tracking compliance toward it, the cloud makes that that much more available to you so that you're not having to have spreadsheets sitting somewhere and then someone else trying to interpret the law and say there. So we're bringing that ability in the cloud of just tracking these. So if someone's compliance department and say, all right, here's the rules, here's the regulations. And whether I'm in the Microsoft cloud or I'm trying to manage my regulatory compliance against another cloud like Salesforce, 
I'm able to do that and I'm able to track it. And it's defensible, I think, is the other important part is you can say, look, I did these steps. Here's where I am in terms of compliance and I'm tracking it. And I know every change that was made to those documents, to those steps, to that information. So I think the cloud brings that power to a lot of organizations and just getting a better handle on what they need to be doing. You know, the big cloud platforms like Microsoft, they employ literally thousands of regulatory specialists. I read it at one point, Microsoft had over 3,000 regulatory specialists just working on GDPR. With that kind of background and backing, vendors who are creating these additional applications, they do have a very seasoned, very educated team at the cloud provider to help them understand this. And one of the things that we rely on is that Microsoft has gone through the hard work of being certified in every known kind of requirement. And they're very good about publishing those and saying, yes, we are, and this is why, and these are the agencies and so forth. So if we're operating within the Microsoft Cloud or the AWS Cloud as a vendor with our application, the cloud provider, the big ones, have done all the work in helping us be able to understand and believe that, yes, if a customer asks us, you know, are we GDPR, it's funny, they'll bring up GDPR certified, which is no such thing, but you operate within GDPR or HIPAA or any of these other things, we can go back and with Microsoft say, well, sure, we're operating within Azure, for example. So yes, we are under these kinds of things. So that's a big help. I mean, having all of those resources behind the curtain to do that and to be able to rely on that, those kinds of things are so costly and they require so many specialists to get to the point to say, yes, we do meet those regulations and this is why. Yeah. It's important there, and I want to kind of build on that point, is I've heard these conversations with customers a lot of time of just, oh, well, once I move to Office 365, I'm HIPAA compliant or I'm GDPR compliant. And unequivocally, the answer there is no. Office 365 enables a organization to reach HIPAA or GDPR compliant, but there are policies and processes that are not technology or require you to configure the technology in a certain way. Now, we've got a lot of guides and information on best practices, but it is up to every individual organization to either by themselves or working with a partner that knows this inside and out to make sure that they're taking it to that last mile. Because the hyperscale cloud providers are doing just that. They're building it for scale. They can't meet every individual regulation that is out there and implementation that's unique to the business. So it's important to say, just because I've started using the cloud, I'm not completely in compliance. And I think that's an important thing for groups to remember. On top of that, I think you mentioned earlier, you know, there is a comfort factor in saying, all right, well, Microsoft is doing everything that they can do to get as close to that as they can. They have regulations on GDPR and being a data processor. When Shrems 2 came out in the European Union last year at this point, that changed the way Safe Harbor was seen and some of the model clauses. Microsoft had a response right away and saying, look, here's how we believe we can do that. And even just last week of when we're recording this podcast, Microsoft made the announcement that says, we're going that next step above and beyond in that we're going to be at a point where, yes, all of our Azure cloud services can already be configured to process data. We're going that next step that says, we will be able to make it to a point where all of your data in the EU will live within the EU. So including support, diagnostic, service-generated data, personal data that we use. So we're extending and expanding on our privacy commitment to our customers to go above and beyond the regulation. So more to come on that. You know, that was a very hot off the press announcement last week, but there will be summits later this year where we're going to start sharing more about that and what we're doing to build better data boundary solutions into our core cloud services. And that's really important. I've written a lot about this over the last couple of years, but data sovereignty. There are country laws that say data generated in France must stay in France unless certain things are meant. But there's lots of countries around the world that basically have data sovereignty laws that say data has to stay here. So having those hundred plus data centers around the world, whether you're Microsoft or AWS or the others versus the one-off 
third party SaaS solution that has a data center in Omaha or something like that. Nothing against people in Omaha, though. <laughs> I love Omaha, by the way. Well, we want to make that very clear. <laughs> Great stakes. But yeah, they need to be very aware of that. We get that question a lot because it's on people's minds now. And having that ability to designate a specific geography for where the data is going to be stored based on data sovereignty issues is a big deal. You were talking about GDPR, and I read that, I'm almost embarrassed to say this, but I read the entire GDPR. And I would say 60 or 70% of the GDPR requirements have nothing to do with technology. They're all process. And like you say, they have to rely on the end user companies to be able to say, this is how we're handling the data. This is what we do before we put it into the cloud, those kinds of things. So when I get the question, is your solution GDPR certified? You kind of, without the customer seeing it, roll your eyes and say, well, there is no GDPR certification, number one. Are your people doing all the required stuff? And then if it goes into and is utilizing the technology, sure, we can say the technology and the way that we tell you to use it meets GDPR requirements, but it's not a one-size-fits-all. If I buy your solution, will we therefore be GDPR compliant? The answer is no. But we can help you do it in a GDPR compliant way. Exactly. And that's the hardest part for people. I still get questions from small banks and stuff saying, are you SEC 17 certified? And I'll say, well, SEC doesn't certify technology or solutions, number one. Those parts of the SEC requirement that require very specific types of technologies, absolutely. But there's a bunch of stuff like GDPR that has nothing to do with the technology. So that's a big part of it. One thing I want to touch on before we end this, the idea that the cloud also allows companies, organizations to consolidate data. Instead of having it in tens or hundreds of different repositories, and I'm not even talking about end user you know, workstations or anything like that, but having some form of management and policies that say, well, gee, I'm going to start consolidating data. So there's one place to check for 60, 70, 80% of the data that's going to speed it up That's going to allow us to better meet privacy regulations, security regulations, and then those data subject access requests. Those are coming up a lot more now with both other companies and clients and other things. We're getting deluged by DSARs, data subject access requests. How can we lower the cost of those and automate them? And by consolidating not all of your data, but a lot of your data in a specific low-cost highly secure repository makes that kind of new environment of responding to data subjects about the data much more straightforward. And it is kind of a balance there of, I think we see a lot of organizations that have had certain non-cloud repositories for years. And they said, I've got to get out of my data center. I've got requirements that if I'm keeping data somewhere, it's got to be on supported hardware. It's got to be on a supported platform. And my storage array is going out of warranty. So I need to do something with that. And we want to bring as much of that data together as cost effectively as possible, too, because you generally don't need this on a real time basis. I'm not keeping this in my hot data tiers. But at the same time, there is a very real cost to moving data around between cloud providers. I think every cloud provider makes it super easy to bring your data in. But if you need to move it elsewhere, get ready to pull out your checkbook. We refer to it as data ransoming. Yeah, it's the state of the industry. I think that's the best way to put that. But it's that balance of how can I reason over the most real-time, freshest data in place so that I'm not paying egregious charges, but also saying, For the places where I need to get at it and it's latent or I don't use it a lot, how can I store that as cheaply as possible? And how can I say that's just one place? So I'm not having to worry about the security profile of an appliance that I bought 10 years ago to manage my e-discovery solution. And I think you put those two together. And what we try to do is through our connector ecosystem and through our APIs, make it easy for organizations such as Archive 360 to attach and say, all right, work with as much data as I can. We'll store it where we need, but 
you don't need to pull data out of places that are being accessed and used real time. So kind of taking advantage of Microsoft scale as a provider that's working with so many organizations, we've got dozens upon dozens of connectors that can pull in and say, all right, I can get your data from WhatsApp or from Bloomberg, pull it in, and then have the tools that can search over that for your DSARS request. You know, we've got our new privacy management solution that is purpose built for handling a DSARS request and the requirements in there. Because although you see a lot of organizations maybe using their e-discovery or other search tools to start it, workflow is different because you're not pulling all information. You may need to redact certain pieces of information. How do I do that in real time? How do I know that if the information I'm grabbing has other sensitive information in there? So looking at tools such as our privacy management and doing the subject access request, it brings it a little more purpose-built again so that you don't need to have been trained in the industry for years upon years to know what to do, but it gives a starting point. And then it lets our partners it lets our customers build on top of that with their individual business requirements. I think that's what's really cool about so many of the solutions that we've put out recently is that we've got a starting point. We've got a great platform that meets the needs of 80, 90% of our customers out there. But when you need that extra 20%, we've built it in a way that you can build on top of it. Yeah. And we mentioned data ransoming, (laughs) which is a long-term ongoing issue with some of the cloud providers, especially some of the third parties. The other issue that you run across, they might say, well, gee, we're not going to ransom your data. It's not a problem. They'll throttle the data. They'll say, well, you know, take all the data you want out, but you you only get a pipe that will give you 100 gigabytes per day or something like that. And you're sitting on six petabytes. You're looking at years to get all your data out. Or we saw it back when organizations were first moving to the cloud and said, oh, I've got to get out of a archiving solution. I want to go native. And what did we get? Rise upon dries of EML files and said, here you go. Yeah. Go nuts. It's like, what do people do with that? So yes, ingestion easy, bringing it out. That's the story. And I think that's where you, know, you and I have worked together in the past is how do we get that data from point A to point B in a way that's actually usable and defensible and has that chain of custody? Yeah. The whole idea of started off this part of the discussion with data consolidation. If you're consolidating more data in a lower cost solution, higher security, it also gives you an easier ability to use next gen analytics and those kinds of things to get more value out of that data that you are holding for long periods of time. But having 16 different repositories with different ways to search and things like that, it is an issue for those companies who are looking at, I want to utilize that data that I'm storing using analytics capabilities and so forth. Okay. Well, I think, Jim, that wraps up this podcast of ours. Again, I want to really thank Jim Bannock from Microsoft on this. This is really an interesting discussion. Be sure to check back with Archive360, our resources slash podcast page to see new podcasts that are coming out on a regular basis. Like I say, I have several more coming out with Minnesota State Representative, a state senator from Colorado and the Colorado Privacy Act. We have a partner from a very large law firm that's a specialist in privacy regulations around the world. We've got a lot of stuff coming out, so keep coming back and checking. If anyone has questions on this topic or would like to talk to a subject matter expert, you know, please send an email mentioning this podcast to info at archive360.com, and we'll get back to you just as soon as possible. Additionally, Jim, did you want to give your email address for somebody to contact you? Yeah, I think the best way if people want to reach out, there'll be a couple links in the notes to the podcast to find out more information about some of the solutions we had talked about. You can also find me on LinkedIn. Just go ahead and, and search for my name. But you know, I think it's a great opportunity of Security gets so much press out there of everybody's trying to stop the attacker from breaching their systems. It's what makes the evening news. But when we think about compliance and privacy, sometimes that is just as important because a lot of times there, it is like insurance. We're having to prove that you need protection from an event that hasn't happened yet. And how do we help IT professionals make the right case to their leadership of why they should do this? How do we help 
IT pros get skilled in being able to manage all this information. So I would love to keep these dialogues open and bring them out in the open because I think this is maybe the next wave of how do we protect organizations is how do we protect the data just as much as we've gotten used to protecting the defenses. Very well put. And again, Jim, thanks for taking the time. A great discussion. I want to thank everyone who is listening to this right now for taking the time. And again, keep checking back with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today on the Information Management 360 podcast, brought to you by Archive 360, trusted by organizations worldwide to manage their data in their cloud under their control. To subscribe to our show or to find out how you can address today's challenges in information management, visit archive360.com forward slash podcasts. 